All right, so just a refresher here in the course section when you get that pulled up. Um, this week you're going to have week uh, two. Um, the due dates, you'll see the announcement I sent out. The dates on all of the homework assignments are all messed up. They they weren't supposed to be showing up there, but they're clearly showing up for students. So I've gone in and fixed the ones for this week. You just have these three labs. Um, these aren't necessarily hands-on skills labs. It's a little bit of research labs, and they don't take very much. Um, just submit those up here to Blackboard. There are some optional labs out here. Um, one in six, which I believe, where do those take you to? Yeah, those are, again, just more case studies. Um, there's nothing that actually goes out to NetLab at this point. I believe next ne next week is when NetLab stuff will kick in. Um, I will record the videos and the stuff that we go over. These are going to be the PowerPoints that I'm going to be going through here today. And then there's old videos down here. This is just prior recordings of these. Um, I need to go ahead and make these available. If you want to watch them, you can. Sometimes questions will come up from other students. Um, so if you've got questions or didn't feel like you understood that topic, feel free to go out and watch last year's video. Um, and those will all be up there. Okay. Um, just as we mentioned before, I'll record all these weekly videos. Those will go out to YouTube. Um, and then the links will get posted in the sections here. So this week, your goal is to read module one, module two. Um, you'll do the one and two exam. And then um, you will complete those three labs here on Blackboard. As far as NetLab, uh, let me pull our uh, NetLab, NetAcad. Let me get that pulled up here. So inside here, you'll get the access to the content. So you'll click on the content, which will obviously give you access to all of it. Um, so this week, we're going to go through modules one and two that you see over here on the left. You can click through all this. Um, this is going to go sometimes in a little bit more detail than what I show in. Uh, let's see here. Do you want our name included on the file for those late submissions? No, you don't have to, Mallory. That's a great question. Um, you don't have to put your name on those. Um, if you submit those to Blackboard, I should have your copy um, when I go to pull that down. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Um, so yeah, when, when we're going through those different sections, um, I encourage you to still go out here and go through this. Don't just listen to the PowerPoints, but you can listen to my video, go through the PowerPoint and you can watch it at 1.5 X, you know, you speed through it kind of thing, um, to kind of help refresh that data. The exams are now activated. I have activated that for everybody that's currently enrolled in the Cisco networking Academy. So if for some reason you did not get enrolled in this section, I will need to go out and manually activate those exams for you. Um, you have, I think you can do like 10 attempts or something like that, and they're up to two hours. So I'm not too worried about the exams. I want you to obviously take them, but um, make sure you solidify your knowledge as you're going through. All right. Let's see here. I think that covers kind of the basics of what we're going through. Next week, um, we will go through uh, we'll go through the NetLab side of things and get you guys connected to that. You don't have to use your accounts or such. It'll all go through Blackboard. Uh, so this week, we're going to go through Module 1 today and Module 2 on Thursday. And then you guys can do these three labs on your own. And then starting next week, we'll typically do the modules all in one day if we can get through the material. And then on the second day, Thursday, we'll get any remaining material and start one of the labs kind of thing together. All right. So for today, we're talking about the um, module here. Let me get this pulled up. All right. Let's see if I can get this moved off here a little bit. All right, so there's lots of different stories out there of people setting up, you know, rogue wireless access points uh, to pull in genuine wireless networks. Um, rogue access hotspots are typically known as the evil twin. This is the kind of stuff that you'll see when you're out going to hotels. Um, you'll see things that look like what they should be for wireless access points. Hotspots are if you're down at cafes or uh, down at the Starbucks, whatever, they'll sound and look like that by name, but they're typically set up as rogue access points. 
You also see things like ransomware companies. I know Lori was just sharing that another company here was hit with ransomware again. So ransomware, the biggest thing with that is employees are usually part of an organization and then they're often lured into opening up attachments. This is all going to be social engineering that we will talk about in this class. Ransomware, once it's installed, begins the process of gathering and encrypting corporate data. So the goal of the attackers is financial gain because they'll hold that company's data for ransom until they're paid. Um, as part of that, a lot of times it's a trust, honor system, whatever you want to call it. When people are ransomware, you will pay to get your information back. You can't guarantee they're going to give your information back or not sell it on the internet. But at the same time, if they just keep the data, it does them no good. They want the money from you. Otherwise, they don't get anything. And we'll talk about the best ways to thwart those kind of things, particularly with ransomware. It's generally backups, right? Um, if you can recover your own data without having to pay for it to come back, you can generally thwart that ransomware attack. Just know that you need to be smart on where you store your backups, because as they start to proliferate your network, they more than likely are encrypting your backup data as well. All right, we, we talk about things like targeted nations. So most of today's malware is so sophisticated and expensive that security analysts have to go through it. Such malware will use to attack the nation's vulnerable infrastructure, such as water systems or power grids. One of those such malwares was Stuxnet, which was a worm that infected USB drives and infiltrated Windows operating systems. It was then targeted in Step 7 software, which was developed by Siemens for the program logic controllers. This is generally all the more that we ever mention about critical infrastructure. But I will mention, I've spent my entire summer writing labs and content and curriculum specifically for critical infrastructure attacks and how that goes on. So I'm trying to get more of that kind of content into the classroom. Um, and as a matter of fact, we may share some of those labs as part of this class. But you know, typically you think of this, in this case, this is a power grid type thing, and it was actually a nuclear power plant um, that they were able to infiltrate. And what they were able to do was reprogram the PLCs for that uh, nuclear power plant to send the drives, or in this case, the motors, and stop the actual gears from turning and stop pumps, which in a nuclear phase, you do not shut down things immediately, right? Things have to gradually come back down. Um, these were written in a way that that was not going to happen. It just immediately shut off the, the PLC controllers. So there's a lot of different attacks here. A lot of times when you deal with PLCs, you're going to deal with SCADA infrastructures, um, which is where PLCs all kind of connect up. And then SCADA gives that human machine interface with that. Um, there is lots of attacks that we're dealing with here on our IT side, which happens all the time on the OT side. And that's basically specified as operations tech. Um, a lot of people that are in the OT space are trying to get trained in cybersecurity in the IT side because it's starting to infiltrate what they're doing on their side. So I, like I said, I worked all summer long building labs for Idaho National Labs and CISA for the national government in order to make sure that we can get critical training out to students in different colleges. Um, so hopefully we can test some of those labs here later this fall. All right, you'll see a video out there where you can go out and look at the anatomy of different attacks. You guys should see this on your own uh, when you go through the content. Watch that video. They do a pretty good job of describing how easy it is to do attacks these days. All right. It shows a lab here of you installing a virtual box machine on this. Uh, we won't do that in this class because you will have access to NetLab. So there's no reason in installing this CyberOps workstation down to your PC. You could do this if you want. Just know that it requires a pretty good amount of resources. That's the reason we have NetLab available to you so that you don't have to have those resources on your local PC. All right. Um, you will go through a couple case study labs. So you'll go through and analyze those. We're gonna talk about a couple of those here this week. So the first thing we're gonna cover is threat actors. And it's important, these are all terms that you're gonna to need to know for the exams, um, as well as if you're ever gonna sit for the certification. So threat actors themselves are going to be individuals or groups of individuals who perform cyber attacks. They're not included, you know, limited to amateurs, hacktivists, organized crime groups, state-sponsored groups, terrorist groups. And cyber attacks are the intentional malicious attack and meant to give negativity to another individual or organization. 
So threat actors is generally the hardest one to figure out why your resources are susceptible um, because these threat actors can be just about anybody, right? And a lot of times, unfortunately, it could be people within your own team and your own organization. So there's these are the main ones they list out here. You're going to have ones like amateurs. These are also known as your script kiddies and have little to no skill. Note that when I first went through cybersecurity here, even you know more than 10 years ago, we had to know all the command lines. We had to know all the different programs, know the exact scripts to run, all the different code in between. That's all been automated in the last 10 years. You don't even have to know much of cybersecurity to download a script, run it against your network, and cause a bunch of chaos. Um, so that's what they're defining here as amateurs. It's really just, say, for example, students in this class who are going out trying to explore a bunch of scripts and they cause a bunch of issues um, unknowingly, either accidental or knowing what they're doing kind of thing. They know they're going to cause harm on the network. Oftentimes, they'll use those existing tools or instructions found on the internet to launch these attacks. And even though they have a basic use of tools, the results can be devastating. Um, a good example of this is we've seen uh, in past years where students will do this against their high school. If they take down the LMS, then they have no way of doing the tests or exams or quizzes that week, et cetera. The student didn't need to know how to do cyber attacks. He just needed a, a small debit card to, to pay people to do a denial of service on the system in there. And that wreaked a lot of havoc when that happened. Um, it seemed like it would just take down the LMS, but what ended up happening is it saturated their internet link. And because the network administrators did not have it properly segmented off, it ended up saturating the entire ring that that node was hanging off of, which in this case was a 10 gig node. So it saturated a full 10 gig internet link going out to the, uh, the uh, overall infrastructure. Bad, bad, bad news. And because every time they shut it down, it would just launch with a new IP address, right? So the students sitting on the inside with basically IP chicken, finding out what the new IP address is. And so they could just feed that information over to the people that are doing the denial of service attack. It's really easy to do. And it cost them maybe $10 kind of thing. It wasn't like it was expensive. All right. So we also have those such as hacktivists. Uh, these are going to be hackers who are publicly protesting some kind of political or social idea. You can typically think of this as anonymous is a pretty famous one for this. They'll tend to post articles or videos leaking sensitive information and disrupting web services with illegitimate traffic, such as a dynamic or a distributed denial of service attack. You'll see those that are out there for financial gain. These are typically of the hacking activity that threatens our security is motivated by financial gain. Criminals want to gain access to bank account information, personal data, and anything else they can leverage to generate cash flow. Those are typically sent out on the dark web, and you can purchase that for other nefarious uses. Um, it's not necessarily to get access to your bank account. They may want to use that um, in terms of uh, stealing your identity, right? So they don't necessarily even want to steal your money, even though this is falling in the financial gain column is they want to get your identity, access to your bank accounts to verify, say, another credit card, and then they can go ahead and set up your account that you unknowingly have these bank accounts and such because you were able to confirm other bank accounts you've had. It's pretty common on the dark web. All right. Um, let's see here. As we look at um, trade secrets, let me change my mic here because I'm guessing it's on the wrong mic. Mallory, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So trade secrets. Um, this is going to talk about at times the nation states hacking other countries. This is what we see the most of right now, right? So if you look at our general landscape um, of where we are in 2023 or where are we? We're 2022. I tried to jump ahead there. Um, we have a bunch of war going on across the world, right? One of the biggest things they were able to do in this war, and it really shined the light on what was going to happen during the next war, the war is not going to be fought with guns and bullets and things like you would see today. Obviously, that's still around, but it's really going to be on the cyber side of things. If we can shut down the infrastructure in order for them to get or to mobilize, then we don't have to worry about the guns and bullets, right? If we shut down the infrastructure in order for them to mobilize. They can't communicate with one another. They can't coordinate who's going to attack when and where. 
we shut that down before it ever starts. So um, in this case, what you're going to see is either interfering things with politics. Oftentimes, you're going to see things that are interested in cyberspace for industrial espionage. Um, the theft of intellectual property can give a country a significant advantage the same way you would see that in a business. So don't think that you don't have things like Google and Amazon going against each other just as much as you have the U.S. and China going against each other or the U.S. and Russia going against each other. Um, even more, what you're finding in the U.S. is, yes, we obviously have our own hackers and things that are sitting somewhere doing different attacks. But just know that you have places like Russia that have warehouses of people that are doing this. In China, you have fields of warehouses of people doing this kind of thing. So um, we're behind the eight ball when it comes to that. I, I, I fully believe that, that there is way more of them than there is us at this point. And that's because they're state sponsored to go do these kind of hacks and attacks. We have our own, but they're probably private individuals that then coordinate with the government. And I say coordinate because they can't say employed. Um, where over there, they're straight employed. That's your 24-7 job kind of thing is to go and attack and see what you can gain data on. Uh, we've seen a huge proliferation of Internet of Things and just how uh, secure are those devices. We use them all the time because they make our life nice. Um, we have many devices on the Internet that are not updated to the latest firmware, nor can they be developed to the latest firmware. So in the early days of IoT, um, they were written in such a way that they were never intended to be updated with patches. And therefore, it creates an opportunity for threat actors and security risks to own these devices and take over them. So one of the biggest issues with this was cameras. Uh, when they were first written, they just didn't give enough space to upgrade the software. And therefore, not only could you not upgrade it, it just left wide open holes all over the place. And so now if you buy you know, cameras that are even from name brands on Amazon, and if you were to able to inspect that traffic, a lot of times you're going to see that that firmware is phoning home. And that phoning home is going to happen in China more often than not. So a lot of times we have to set up firewalls on our own local networks, and I'm talking about in your home, to block outbound traffic from those particular devices. If you don't, you're constantly sending information back home to somebody. Whether it's actual video footage or if you're just talking about communications, when you accessed it, when you didn't access it, that kind of thing is all being sent somewhere, somehow. Um, this comes back to updates. They always code that under the term that, oh, you're it's just phoning home to check for an update. Well, it phones home every five seconds. Um, why is it phoning home every five seconds for an update kind of thing? And I see this all the time when I install security cameras. All right, so you'll have a lab that talks about the details of an attack. Again, I'll let you guys go through that. When we talk about uh, different threat impacts, we talk a lot about PII or personal identifiable information. Those are some of the acronyms you're gonna need to know. That is any information that can be used to positively identify an individual. For example, it's name, social security number, birth date, credit card numbers, et cetera. Those cyber criminals will aim to obtain those lists of PII and then can make them sold and available on the dark web. Stolen PII can be used to create fake financial accounts such as credit cards and short-term loans, kind of what I was talking about before. You'll also see in the medical community that we create and maintain electronic medical records or EMRs, and those are meant to contain protected health information or PHI, a subset of PII. And this is pretty common today of medical records being exposed um, as we're trying to get hospitals to share those records among different hospitals, right? So you don't have to take all of your records and go to another hospital. They should be able to have a universal database, so to speak. That's great until there's a universal database, right? There's always a downside to that kind of information. Um, most people think it's just my personal health records. What could I really do with that? I could find out what pacemaker you're running. I can figure out if it's Wi-Fi exposed. I can figure out your diabetic information and pull that information as I walk by you and pull your Bluetooth, find out what your blood sugar levels are. So again, I don't have to hack your computer. I could hack you. If you're in the middle of logging into a website and I'm able to set your insulin pump to pump too much insulin to you, you're going to go into a diabetic attack, which causes e EMS and everybody to come get you, right? What just happened? Computers left unlocked. I can now walk up and start working on your computer. Nobody would know the difference because they're too distracted by your diabetic attack. 
it sounds far fetched, but it's not. That's what they do today. The more integrated we are with those kind of materials, that's what we can do with public health information. We have personal security information or PSI. Again, another type of PII, this will include your usernames, passwords, other security related information that individuals use to access information and services on a network. We use social engineering, which we'll talk about in order to gather this information. All right, so loss competitive advantage. This is another threat impact. We talked about threat actors. This is gonna be your threat impact. Um, this will be the loss of intellectual property among competitors is a serious concern. Additional concern is the loss of trust that comes when a company is unable to protect its customers' data. That loss of competitive advantage may come from the loss of trust rather than another company or country stealing trade secrets. What are they talking about? They're talking about the targets of the world, right? You go shop at Target, your credit card information gets into their system, that gets hacked, you lose all of that data outside of there, right? If that was hacked by somebody, say, Amazon to figure out how many people are buying what product at Target so that they can make that available on Amazon and target those individual users, that would be now more towards intellectual property of how many people are buying what particular item, right? And obviously, you guys know the size of Amazon, right? A couple billion dollars sitting around. They can do that kind of stuff and you would never know the difference, right? So finding the information on how many of what item is sold is big business. And it's not just businesses that will get hacked. You have state-sponsored hacker warriors that will cause disruption or destruction of vital services. We saw this recently. Um, it's not so recently. It was last year um, when they were able to stop oil tankers and things like that, um, or they were able to stop shipments in different areas. We can see that kind of disruption. The internet itself is essential for a medium for commercial and financial activities. However, the disruption of those activities can devastate a nation's economy. If we were to kill this, even a few stockbrokers transactions, we could cause massive chaos in just doing that. You can crash the entire stock market just by killing the network that runs those transactions. You wanna talk about the most secure, fastest operations in the world? It's stockbroker networks, hands down. Those guys live for latency. They got to have the lowest latent networks, the most diverse, robust networks I've ever seen. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're working for <laughs> the government or anywhere else. Those guys have some pretty tight speed networks. All right. You'll have a lab on visualizing the black hats. This kind of walks you through the scenarios and highlighting that. Again, this is part of all your homework assignments that you'll have listed there. So to summarize, what did we end up learning today? This is kind of how I do these PowerPoints. I'll talk what's on the PowerPoint, but I don't like to regurgitate everything on there. I will try to include a bunch of real life experience stuff with that. So today was all talking about threat actors. Know the and understand the different types of threat actors. Do you guys remember those? Right? You can read line two. <laughs> You've got the amateurs. Those are also known as your script kitties. You've got hacktivists. You can think of things like anonymous, organized crime groups. Um, this is going to be things like the mafia who used to do that kind of stuff back in the day. Um, you have state-sponsored. This is referring to things like China and Russia being sponsored by their country, as well as terrorist groups inside of there as well. Uh, when it comes to the IoT, it, as it expands, we have webcams, routers, you know, stoves, refrigerators, all this kind of stuff, which is IoT. Those are under attack because a lot of them, when they were first written, were not designed to be upgraded. You can't upgrade the firmware at any point. PII, remember all those acronyms? PII is kind of that over-encompassing umbrella. So think of it as the outer portion of personable identifiable information. That's anything that can be used to positively identify a particular individual. More detailed PII is going to be things like electronic medical records, such as EMRs. And those contain personal or protected health information, PHI, which is all a subset of that PII. You're also going to have a subset of your personal security information. This will be your usernames, passwords, and other security-related information in order for you to access networks. All right. And that concludes that first module. Anybody got any questions on this side?
see if I can pull up the online. Keith Mallory. Nope. Thank you. No problem. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.